Good morning and uh, welcome to the to our um, excuse me our sharpening sink this morning. Um, I basically what I'm going to go over is the tune up and or, or I'm going to at least talk about the tune up of um, your standard bench planes and what and what what we uh, what we need to do to get them sharp. So it is primarily about getting the blade sharp and I'm going to use an old uh, Miller's Falls plane for that. And uh, we will, I'll, I guess I just launch into it. So um, bench planes, your standard bench plane, um, you know, you all know they come in a variety of sizes and have slightly different functions. The longer the blade, the plane is, if it's straight, the, the straighter the, um, the piece of wood you can plane out of is. So um, for, you know, when you need to, to get something that's fairly long like a plank, you use a jointer or a jack plane like this, depending on the size of the piece. Um, so I'm going to go over today the tune up and sharpening of um, jack planes generally, uh, I mean, not jack, jack planes, bench planes generally, and um, specifically the smaller one that I have here. But it, the same uh, basic principles apply to even these uh, high end ones like the Lee Nielsen we have here in the shop. Um, same basic principle, except that a lot of what I'm going to do today never needs to be done to these guys because they're set up right the first time. So I'm going to put that one aside. So basically, what a plane does is I'll bring up, I'll come up close to here, is there is a blade sticking through a hole in the bottom of the plane. And how far that blade sticks through the bottom of the plane governs how, um, how effective your cut is, whether it's a deep cut or a fine cut, and how close the blade is, the blade being here, I know my fingers are big, so it's hard to see. This blade is to the front of the mouth, to this line across here, governs how fine a cut you can get. This is not a, oh, this is a good, this is a great plane. Yeah? This is a record, an older record. Um, and uh, it, it's set up pretty nicely. You can see the, the, the uh, sole of it is, it is almost an earth finish. You can see reflections in it. Um, uh, that's probably overkill, but you know, I just do that. But, but basically that the bottom of this plane has to be absolutely dead straight. There can be some, some depressions or dings, even some planes are corrugated, but basically you want this entire entire sole, as it's called, the bottom of the plane, to be, to be um, flat. The most important spots are here, where, where, you where your wood first touches, where, where your plane, sorry, first touches the, the uh, wood. It, so you want it to be flat from there. It also needs to be really flat right here. Because what happens is, as you push the plane along the wood, this area here compresses the fibers of the wood, and that helps to get a fine cut. And uh, uh, Paul, yes, uh, you had said two things. I'm trying to reconcile in my brain. One is that the deeper the blade protrudes through the mouth, the more material or the deeper the cut you'd get. Then you also yeah. said the distance between the front of the blade and the front of the mouth. Yes. determines how fine it is. What's the difference between the word fine and depth of cut? I mean, how, how, how are they related? Okay, yes. So if we, if we substitute the word coarse for depth of cut, um, the depth of cut could be measured as, as coarse or fine. As well. I'm sorry, I'm, that was not quite right. Your depth of cut is how much wood you're actually going to peel off of your... Off of your um, piece of wood. Um, and what happens is if you make your depth of cut deeper, that is you're cutting a thicker piece of wood, you, um, you need a slightly wider gap in here in order to allow the, the shaving to run up through and, and, and go out the top there. Um, but basically depth of cut, coarse and fine if you like, or you know, thick and thin, um, I always pursue getting my planes to be able to get as thin a cut as possible because that means I've got a nice 
straight line here at the cutting edge and a nice straight line here at the mouth. And they're all lined up so that the way that you set the plane, can you see that little black line? Can you hear me, Travis? You can see it a yes. little bit. Okay, so you can see that little black line there. I'm trying to get it so the camera can see it. And if I adjust it, I make it coarser, you will see that black line get. Meaning the blade is protruding more. Yes, and I'm going the wrong way because it's upside down to me. Now you can see that that black line is, is substantially thicker. Yes. Okay, that would be an incredibly coarse depth of cut and hard work. It's when you're using a plane, it's better to cut a thin, a very thin cut and do it more often. It's a lot less work um, and you get a better result as well. So does that make it any clearer for you? So, Paul, I was really trying to get the relationship between the depth of cut and the gap between the blade and the front of the mouth. It sounds to me like maybe you just want to have the blade, the distance between the blade and the front of the mouth to be at least big enough to accommodate the depth of cut Absolutely. shape you produce. Yes. But not excessively large. You want to be just like a little bit larger than the exactly. thickness of the shave that you will remove with that depth of cut. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Yes, absolutely, yes. So when you get to a fine cut, you want that distance to be less. Got it. However, um, for general use, <laughs> you don't, once you've set it for yourself, you don't generally adjust it on the fly with these kinds of planes, but, but you can. So to continue, so we want it to be flat here, we want it to be flat here. And then if there's a little hollow in here, that's not an issue. If there's a little hollow just behind the blade, not so much of an issue just behind the blade here because the blade's already protruding slightly below the, 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 um, the sole here. And then we want it to be flat back there. So until you can achieve that flatness at, the, at least those three points and preferably a lot more, you're not going to be able to get a really fine cut with the plane. This is, that will greatly improve the, uh, your ability to adjust and to use your plane. So, I use the bigger plane because it's a little easier to illustrate. I'm gonna now go over to, I'll bring, yeah, let's go to the, the close-up camera. So the plane I'm gonna work on today is a, an old number nine Miller's Falls plane. It's probably from the 1930s, 1940s. Um, bought it several years ago from someone in the uh, hand tool joinery class. And um, I, uh, I, I was doing the uh, plane, uh, restoration and making class at the time. So I, I, I tuned this baby up. It's old, it's got a hole in the sole because this particular woodworker um, used to hang it on a nail, I guess, or on a screw or something like that. But it follows the pretty much the standard design of, uh, of a bench plane. What you have is obviously a handle or tote at the back and then a handle and knob at the front. You have a, you can see it in red, it's called the frog, and I'll show you more pictures of it. You have a frog, you have a lateral adjusting, uh, not a lateral, a, this is the adjuster that brings your blade up and down, controls your depth of cut, and then you can see just behind that, there's a small screw, a couple of screws and a plate of metal. That is the adjuster to move the frog back and forth, which is how we adjust that gap between the mouth and the blade in normal use. And in order to get that out, we have to take the blade out and undo a, loosen up a couple of screws below, which I will show you. So, and then you have on top of it, you have what's called the cap arm, I, I believe. Forgive me if my nomenclature is not entirely right. 
Um, this is a, a funky design as much as it's primitive, but it's, uh, it's when, you, when you go to sharpen a blade, this is the first thing you take off. So I release this and it's kind of tight because this is a slightly finicky plane in use. So should we go a little closer? Yep. As soon as we're ready. Okay, super. All right, so the, the next thing that we take out is the blade and the chip breaker. And let me stand here, that might be easier to see. So we have a blade and it's attached to the chip breaker, which you can see has a slight, um, what's the word? Concavity or convexity, depending on which side of the piece of metal you're, you're looking at. But it's, it sort of acts as a, a spring because it's secured by this little screw here. And it is also set pretty close to the, to the front of the backside of the blade, as it were, near the, the front end. And as I take it to pieces, it'll become more clear. So when we, in the past, we've talked about polishing the back, uh, and this is what the chip breaker goes, goes up against. And I've talked about the fact that with a plane, you don't need to polish it a long way back because this is the only part that really matters, is this little bit of blade protruding. So this is kind of set for a medium to coarse cut. Um, and I'm not going to uh, probably change that today because this is not really a, um, you know, a super high end plane by any means. Um, but pretty much this design is, is uh, what bench planes or Bailey planes as they're known. It was a design that came up in I think Bailey came up with them in the 1880s and the Stanley Rule and Level Company bought the patents from him eventually after he'd been in production for a few years and uh, modified the design somewhat and made themselves pretty much the, uh, the standard in terms of, of, of playing uh, quality um, and, and Stanley are the standard for if you want to buy an old plane I would suggest that uh, Stanley is a good bet. Um, so Need my screwdriver. I'm going to take the blade apart. If this, the reason I want to sharpen this blade, it's actually been hollow ground, which is going to make it a little easier for me. But I, the reason I want to sharpen it is it's just not performing right. And there's something just not quite right about it. So um, I'm going to take it to pieces. And it's, sometimes you have to put this on a bench and hold it down. And you take the chip breaker. <laughs> You'll notice there's a nice clean line there. You'll, that's relevant. Um, we take it off and you can see that I have a nicely polished back on this one, so I don't need to repolish it. So I'm gonna go through the motions for those of you who don't know about cleaning up the back. It could use some improvement. There's a little bit of a dull point on the edge there, but you know, like I say, this is not a super high-end plane and I'm not setting it up for, 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 for real smoothing. It's just general use. So we're gonna talk about how do we sharpen this plane. The first thing you do when you're sharpening a plane, I'll talk about the frog a little later. Um, where did I put it? Oh, there it is. Is we want to establish what angle the bevel, that is the angle of the, I'm sorry, there we go. Is that better? Yeah. yeah, the angle of the blade as it cuts away from the back. It's usually 25 degrees. And I would have to hold this up to, to the light, but I can see what you want to do is to, to take that, take that little, this little brass piece, which you can buy for a relatively small amount of money and, uh, and check out what the angle is. As long as you've got a gap there, um, it's not the right angle. Does that make, yeah, does that? help a bit. Um, you know, for example, if I go to a lower angle, I've got a gap on this side here. So I just keep going around. And I know this one is at 25 degrees. So we now I can set it in my wonderful, very tough piece. So we've talked about this before. This is a, a, a honing guide or a sharpening guide made by Veritas and by general consensus of, of the people who've, who've uh, been involved in this, uh, 
in this um, sea. It's a really good one, and that's my opinion as well. I bought one for myself. Um, it's this real advantage for us is that we can preset the angle and check the and do the squareness. So we're gonna. I've already preset this to twenty five degrees, but I can move this little device back and forth. Then I'm going to attach it to a fence on the front of the. Gotta, you got to get this right. <laughs> so my blade's going to come through here, so I want my fence to be here. Okay. And then, you know, there are some options in terms of where you place your fence in relation to, uh, to the you know, depending on the width of the blade. So I'm gonna place my fence about there. So it's set for 25 degrees and secured to this here. It should be at 90 degrees. We're gonna check that. So the first thing we do when going to sharpen a plane blade is we look at whether or not it is square. I don't want to touch, well, I guess I'm sharpening this so I can touch it. You can see there that my square gets pretty darn close to the blade there. There may, there, there may, there is a little, I can tell you if I hold that up to the light, there's a, there are a couple of little specks of light coming through there. So there's something not quite right with this blade. So um, Paul, but that, yes. Does that mean that the sides of all of these plain blades are always parallel? That is to say the mm -hmm. long edges are always parallel so you can always use a, a square to check? Great question, and thank you for asking. Um, good point. Generally speaking, these manufactured ones um, from, uh, you know, steel or iron body planes are generally speaking, you know, uh, square parallel to each other, but not always, especially in older planes. So sometimes you have to make a judgment call. Okay. So I'll show you how to do that in a moment. So, okay, I'm moderately happy with that, but I, what I'm going to do now is mark the square on the blade. So I'm gonna take my square here. I'm gonna bring it relatively close to the edge of my blade. And again, you can see that they're fairly close to parallel. So I may not actually need to do this on this, but we're gonna do it anyway. I find this is the only square that I find really is, is good for this. It's a, it's a little, um, engineer square. So I'm going to just take my vital tool, the permanent marker. And when you're online, of course, you get nervous, so your fingers shake a little bit. And you can see that I've now got a more or less square line there. I'm trying to get the light so it doesn't, there we go, on there. So now as I as I um, grind the, the blade here, I can look at where things are in relation to that line and see whether I'm going towards or away from my, 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 my cross line there. Now the way to check whether they're parallel is to mark that there, just as we did there, and switch the blade over, put it on the other side. And if there's a difference between them. Very good then you have to make a judgment call. Got it. But um, that's, you know, generally speaking, these, these machine made uh, blades are, are pretty nice. So this one's pretty close to parallel. Doesn't need much work. Plus it's already been sharpened some time ago on a, on a Tormek, on a hollow grind Tormek there. So um, the next thing is to put it into our pig. And the first thing you do, I don't know if you other woodworkers encounter this, but when I turn things upside down or switch from a router to a router table or whatever, I get things really wacko sometimes. So I have to think with this, where is my blade going to be in terms of its, where, where do I need to sharpen it? So what I want is I want my roller to be running on the bottom there, back and forth like this. Hey, Paul? Yes. Since, since you have a Tormek, or at least a wet grinding system, 
Yes. Do you just use this jig and whetstone process for a quick touch up? Or do you always do your uh, planes blade sharpening on this system as opposed to your Tormek wet, wet, wet grill, wet gr grinder? Wet grill. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting concept. I bet you could sell that on late night TV. Yeah. Wet grill. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, what you're asking is, is did it, basically, did I or, or is it possible to sharpen your plane blades purely with this? And, and before I had a wet grinding system, uh, yes. And sometimes, especially with these thinner ones, I, it's, it's actually less hassle just to sharpen the darn thing up by hand, less time and less hassle yeah. than it is to set up a torment. Uh, you know, probably for catch up, right? Yes. Yeah. And, well, in this case, yes, but you can also grind to, you know, from a really rough blade to this as well. It's, it can take some time. Yeah. It can say, take some time. And this is why we always use the coarsest, coarsest necessary to do the job because we don't want to waste time rolling back and forth on a, on a, on a finer grit until we've got the shape correct. Right. Which... Uh, Okay, so I'm going to set this with my bevel facing the, the roller here. I'm saying this almost as a reminder to myself in future. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna open that baby up a bit. Get my blade through. And this in theory sets me up with both my 90 degrees to the jig, which will set me up at 90 degrees to the stone and also the, the correct length there for, for us to get the 25 degrees. And I'm gonna, while making sure, and these things move around as you tighten them up. So just keep checking stuff. Hey, Paul, just because it might not be obvious to people and because you convinced me to buy one of these previously. Yes. You just flip it over and just show the gauge again. Depending yes. on how far the blade protrudes out defines how shallow or thick the angle will be. So you can see as he goes further out on there, uh, he's getting a, a smaller and smaller angle. And as he goes closer with the length of the blade, he's getting a wider and wider angle. So that, that's how this, this jig works. And that, that attachment that he was just pointing at with the numbers, that is something that will come off when he starts doing the actual grinding. It's really just to set up the jig with the proper length so you get the right angle. I just wanted to point that out because it, it, it wasn't obvious to me when I first got it. And I really appreciate how much smarts they built into this uh, system. It's really impressive. It's very well designed, isn't it? These also, it also has adjustments so that you can do a back bevel if you should choose to. And you can also do an extra mi micro bevel on, wow. on, on here as well by, by adjusting it to the one or the three. I can't remember which is which, but that can take the guesswork out of you guys have seen and you'll see me demonstrate that little micro bevel. That can take the guesswork out of it and you can do it at exactly the same angle, angle every time. It's just, you have to set it up, so. Yeah. But, but as a beginner, I found that it really, really, the more empirical you can get about these things and the more, you know, the closer you can to get, to get them just right, the better it is. So you want to tighten this down. And then the final check, is, well, there are two final checks. One is I wanna check the square anyway, because it could have moved while I was, there's a way to, I know, I remember, yeah. That's the way to do it with this baby, is to put the thick piece. See, I'm, I'm putting it along here, put that there. And that way it's, the one side of the square is, is on the, uh, on the jig and the other side is on the, on, the, uh, on the blade there. And then I can again check that and get my fingers out of the way so you can see it for yourselves. And again, holding it up to a light, preferably natural light, but, but you know, a nice bright uh, artificial light will do it too. We'll give you an idea. So we know now that at least going into this, my blade is perpendicular 
to the angle here. And as we're going to be going along the stone like that, it should be at the right angle. And this I'm going to hold, hold up to the light, largely because I don't want to waste you guys' time watching me do this. Sharpening can be very, very time consuming. <laughs> um, if you, it, and that's why I think people, one reason people like the, the uh, no, we'll, we'll be going back to the, to the, um, uh, one reason why, why uh, people like the wet sharpener is it gives a feeling that you, you, you've got some control there and some speed. And it is fast, I have to say. If you've got a lot of work to do, uh, it's, it's really good. And, it, it, you know, I like both systems, um, but very often the hand system is a little quicker and easier to do, um, as long as you don't have heavy work. But if I were to buy, I've shown you some of these, these plain blades that I've, that I've got that are, you know, better part of, of a quarter inch thick and they're tapered and they've got all sorts of fun things with them. Something like that, it's a heavy thick blade and the torment really makes a world of difference in terms of you know the difference between 45 minutes and five hours. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I'm gonna just, I, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna hold it up towards the window like that. Oh, sorry, there we go. And I will be looking to see if I can see a gap there. Hey, Paul, do you have a preference for stones? Yeah, what? I'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay, great. Okay, so this is the, the leading edge. This edge is setting down on the stone here. So I want to actually push the blade out just a tiny bit. And I may well have to put my... No, I won't put that back in, but this is where having a square can be helpful. Yeah, I've moved that forward a little tiny bit. In my square, you can see. Oh, you, you, yeah. Oh, black. Huh? Did you, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear you. It was, it was someone with our meeting. Oh, someone's answering system. Oh, right. Oh, okay, good. Then we can proceed. All right. So what I've got now is, oh, sorry, <laughs> getting confused, is um, that thing's pretty much setting and there's no light coming through, which means that I, I'm, I'm going to have it at set at my 25 degrees or at the degrees that this is. Um, so it, it's just gonna save me some effort. I had it set at exactly 25 degrees. That little meter only gives you it in two and a half degree uh, increments. So you have to think about checking it as well. So now I know that my blade is square. I'm gonna double, double check that because it, it's, it's so frustrating to, to, uh, to actually uh, grind a blade off square which is, I spent a lot of time doing that in my early days. And that's not quite square, so I'm gonna move it slightly. Okay, and now I'm gonna double check my, and I've gone back to being a little, this is where I'm gonna just tap it. I need to still come forward a little bit more. Each time I make these adjustments, I have to check the full set of adjustments. Oops. Okay, that's pretty good. So now before anything else, I'm going to tighten everything up and I tighten them as far as I can. You really don't want to have to um, use a wrench or anything on it. And then I do a final check. Because that old adage of inspect what you expect. When your own sweat goes into it, <laughs> you begin to... Uh... Okay, so one size... 
you, yeah, you get, get a little more careful. All right, so we're pretty darn close. So I've set it up square, or as square as I reasonably can. And the next thing I'm going to do is start working it. As I work it, I want to check this every now and again. But what I'll re really be working towards is this edge here. You can see um, I've already obs partially obscured some of it. But um, this little black line, um, if I go wild, you know, if anything goes out of parallel, I immediately able to be able to see it. And I can always find a way to. <laughs> um, once you got it set in, it's hard to get it set. You have to do something like that to redo the, the line there, which you, you, you do sometimes. Once you have this thing set up in the jig and you know it's square, and you know it's set right, until it's completely sharpened, don't do anything else. <laughs> don't play with it. Don't adjust it while you're sharpening. And while you're, you're sharpening, try to hold the jig rather than the blade, because I find when I put my fingers on the blade, I have to put them near the front. But if I, what the problem is, you tend to move the blade around. So you have to be very careful when your fingers are on the blade about moving it around. And that's, again, where this little black line helps, because if you, if you are somebody who say your right hand just pushes a little harder than the left hand, you'll start seeing the, uh, so seeing it go off parallel there and getting, getting it to be a finer edge here than it is here. So a finer mark rather. So the one thing I am lacking is water. So you, it's nice to have a sprayer. I'm gonna, now I'm gonna talk about Travis's question about preferences for stones. There's a lot of mystique about sharpening equipment and a lot of talk and everybody has their own preferences. Um, having been a TA in a carving class, what I saw was that the, the, um, the, the stones got very rapidly, got grooves and got worn and um, went out of flat and were generally pretty much useless. Um, to some, especially to somebody who's trying to learn the, the, the skill for the first time. So um, the big problems with stones are that you can create grooves in them very easily and they wear out really quickly. Um, they wear out and more important, they wear out of square. So you have to flatten them on a fairly regular basis. Um, some years ago, they, they uh, started using industrial diamonds bonded to steel plates. Um, to, uh, in order to um, create a flatter grinding plate. So you can buy diamond plates in all kinds of varieties. This is my preference. It's, I do have other diamond plates, but this is the first one I ever bought. And, and I like to, you, I do use it a lot. I don't really have another substitute for it. It's got two plates, one on each side. And it costs at a local, um, woodwork shop that has a, 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 blue, a lot of blue in its sign. Um, you can uh, buy it for about $60, $70. It is a 600 grit or fine 600 grit and super fine 1200 grit diamond stone. Um, really, really good value, especially when you're starting out um, because you can spend an awful lot of money on these stones. Um, and uh, so that's, that's my preference for, especially for coursework. When we get into the, the, the fine tuning of this thing, then um, that's a slightly different story, but, but we'll, we'll move on to that. Hey Paul, but, what, what is the brand on that? And what are the dimensions on that? It is an easy lap. And would you believe we're doing a woodworking thing and I haven't got a measure available. Okay, but it's roughly. It's about it? nine inches long, the, the actual, Blade is four, five, about eight inches long, okay, and, and about three, in, three inches wide. Okay, and the, what, the grit you can use if you had Doing one two-sided stone or diamond stone, say a six hundred and a twelve hundred grit. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank yes. you. Yes, and it's easy dash lap. Um, 
they, they, they're easily found. There is also, if you want to see the full range of sharpening equipment, um, sharp, sharpeningsupplies.com have just about everything you could want. Tormex uh, and all kinds of, of uh, sharpening systems for, for hand tools as well. Great, thank um, you. All right, so what I mentioned about Courses grip. To, at this point, what I'm really doing is shaping, creating the shape of the blade. And I'm creating that shape in two ways. I'm creating the bevel here, and then I'm also creating that nice clean line at 90 degrees there. So I'm going to just start by a little bit of water on a diamond stone. You don't need a lot. And because it's in a jig, I can run this back and forth. The moment I start sharpening freehand, I'm gonna be only pulling my blade backwards, but as long as it's in a jig, I'm gonna just. So, in the spirit of checking things, I've done it, I've done a few, uh, a few strokes there, and it looks like it's still heavy on the front end because there's nothing, it's nice and clean up here and there's no reaction there, but I think we'll get one soon. So I think my angle is close, but not perfect. And I'm gonna just uh, run this back and forth. And that would be a great time for me to uh, answer any questions if people have as things come up, but I'm just gonna run this back and forth. You'll notice that I try to move it around on the plate so that even diamond diamonds wear. So I just try to move it around and every now and again, I'll turn the plate around as well. So this is the 600 grit I'm using. And I don't know if you can see, but I'm creating an edge here. It's a little wider there. It's a little wider there. I should really check my adjustment on this because I maybe might save myself a little time. So just one moment, bear with me. Yes, it's still a little bit far forward. So I'm gonna push my blade out a little bit. See if that's better. I'm sorry to take it off camera, but the only way to be sure is to check it up against the light for me. So with the new, what I didn't do was check the square on that. Okay, well that's bound to be a little better. It's not, it's not still not touching this front end, but I'm just gonna go with it. A little bit more water. Maybe a bit too much. As with the chisel, the heavy duty stuff takes a little bit of time, but once we get into the lightweight, it's easy. So if I were polishing the back of this, because it was a new plane that I bought for the first time and it wasn't a or an old plane that I, I was starting to work on. Um, if I were needing to, to uh, flatten the back of this, I'd, do, I'd use the same, st I'd start with the same stone or coarser, depending on what's needed. It has to be flat though. And all the stones you use as you progress must be of similar flatness or they're not gonna work right. Um, you can see I'm cutting the front edge there, but I'm not fully cutting um, back here. So again, I could push my blade forward a bit. I'm going to grind this until I've got enough to get my edge there. I can see that I haven't, I've, I've hit the edge there, but I haven't hit it here. So at least once I've got enough clean exposure there, I can create an edge on the front as long as it's square. So um, 
I would, if I were at home, I'd spend another 20 minutes or so. I, at some point with the adjustment, you get to the point where you go, just, just roll with it. It takes me longer to keep adjusting it than it does to grind the thing down. So um, I'm going to uh, just grind for a moment or two, create that edge a little bit better. Hey, Paul, there's, yes. no, way, there's no way to do a hollow grind in this system, right? No, okay. but you can work with a hollow grind. Right, but you're just you're just eating away at the hollow, creating a, a flat edge, correct? Yes. Okay. So if I'd set this up absolutely perfectly, it would have created two flat edges, one on the front edge and one on the back edge of that hollow. Back. Yeah. Yeah. On here. Now this is a fairly thin blade. If it were a thicker blade, I'd be setting it up more carefully. But contrary to what a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of people talk about sharpening and, you know, they want to see the polish all the way back, all the way up the bevel and so on. Here's the thing is you've got the only part that counts <laughs> is that little line right there. Yeah. And the thinner that little line is, the better. Everything behind it, it a polish here serves to, well, in this case, because it's a bevel down plane, this is what this polish is what serves to move my shaving, guide my shaving up and, and not to obstruct it. But um, but back here, all I really need is that little edge on there. So I'm going to work this for like one more minute, two more minutes, and then we'll flip over to the next side and, and get this up to a polish and sharpen it. But just remember that, that you know, it's it's only the leading edge that matters. As long as your back is polished. And I'm going to change that angle anyway. <laughs> so we, I, I've talked about this in the past as well, but um, when you just do a blade at 25 degrees like this, especially on a thin blade like this, without putting it in a jig, it's kind of hard to pick up that 25 degrees perfectly and get that polish on the whole bevel so there's a the and also um the the if if you change that angle slightly so you make it a slightly wider angle it it makes the leading edge of the blade a tiny bit stronger and it also most important you'll you'll see what i mean in a little while um, most important makes it so uh, the blade is easy to resharpen in a very short while. Now you can see that I've already cut through 50% of the bevel there. So, and I've got a nice clean edge on that front edge. So, this dull part here, if I were to work another five minutes or so, I'd have my bevel all the way up, right? So now, while I'm, I've still got it in the jig, set at exactly the same angle, flip it over, work up to a slightly coarse or, or twice as it, It's not twice as coarse. The numbers are twice as much, but they, there's, a, there's actually a lot of variety in grit numbers. Um, you know, between sandpaper and diamond plates. And it's hard by the very nature of the definition of a grit size. It's hard to, to be uh, really precise about it. And also all of these things are made in machines that give you actually, you know, when it says zero to three microns on say a diamond paste powder, that's because they just can't get rid of all the, all the 0 0.001 micron particles and they can't get rid of all the 3.2 particles. You know? so, um, so anyway, now I'm over onto the 1200. Once you get to about 1200 grit, you begin to see less of a scratch pattern and something, if not close, if not a polish, a little bit of a luster. And I mentioned this earlier, just make a habit of, on all your stones turning them out because you don't want to wear out one edge or one end. And you tend to wear out, to wear the most right in here right in the middle. So make sure you move your blade at angles. Now this is continuing to abrade, but it's also 
giving me a bit more of a polish here. So, you can see that's a nice clean edge there. So now I'm going to move on to polish it on a stone. And I, in order to keep things simple today, I'm just going to go to a straight 8,000 stone. A lot of people progress up through the stones. I like to do that. Always clean your stones after you, whether they're diamond stones or whatever, clean, clean them after you use them. It's, it just feels better. <laughs> so, now I wanna point out something that the size of plane that we're talking about, this little guy, the common name for them is a smoother. And the purpose of a smoother is to make things smooth. So their purpose is once you've got everything nice and flat and straight, you use one of these guys to make things smooth. If you have sharp edges, real sharp corners here, which is what we create when we do it right on, the, on here, what happens is you leave little tracks in the wood. So most woodworkers will Kind of at the end of it all, they'll put a little, they'll, they'll run the, it back and forth with a little more pressure on that side than that. Veritas, for those of you who love your gadgets, make exactly the same deal, but it's got a cambered wheel. So it's, it's got the same roller as you use for a flat blade. Oh, sorry. Uh, same roller you use for a flat blade. I mean, the same jig there, but you can see this one has a, has a camber on it. And that means that you can switch these out and now put a little camber on your blade. So now what you're actually doing is, 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 hot, is taking out a little scallop. And that way you can smooth off a piece of wood without the edges of your plane cutting. Because it's, it's so frustrating for your plane to do a beautiful, beautiful polished cut that doesn't need any finish. And then you see a little track on the side there. So now you have to take a piece of sandpaper and sand it. And if you sand that little bit, then that's going to show up under the finish as different from the other. So now you've got to sand the whole thing. So um, a true smoothing plane is designed to make that actually make your wood surface of your wood as smooth as possible. It will have little scallops in it because your blade is now cambered. But that's how you create it um, using the Veritas system. And that has the same adjustments for um, for different camber for different um, cambers here. So just a neat little difference. The, the basic okay. result you get when you use that other wheel is that the corners are raised from the surface, correct? Yes. What you're aiming to do is take this this flat plane here and to curve it slightly. Yeah, yeah. So this edge gets a little. You're not actually. You're not just knocking off the corners. You're actually putting a slight curve on the blade. Understood, there. but the corners aren't touching because they are sort of rounded up a touch. Yes, okay. exactly, yeah. yes. So now I'm gonna to go to, first time I saw someone jump from like around a thousand size to eight, 8,000, well it was 10,000 actually, was oddly enough, Lee Nielsen. That they're, every year, I hope they do it next January or that they're able to, but every year Lee Nielsen come to Palomar College and they show off their goodies in January or February. And um, they, uh, they offer a 10% discount. And if they have to ship it to you, they um, will ship it for free. So you get 10%, no shipping if they've got it in stock there. And then if you buy it and it has to be sent to you, then, uh, then you don't have to pay shipping on that. So that's a pretty good deal. And they usually come every year. But one thing they do is they give them sharpening demonstrations. And this guy, he took a blade, he, he used, uh, I think, 600 and then 1000 or something like that to get the shape back. And then he jumped to 10,000. Huh? That seems a little strange, but it works. So you maybe have to work a little bit more. So I'm going to jump straight from 1200 to 8,000 in terms of my polish.
Okay, I don't know if you can see, but that is a much more um, polished surface now than it was. I think you can catch at least the glint of it. Yeah. So I'm creating that nice polished surface. I'm going to work it just a little bit more because I can still see a couple of lines. So really, the reason that going straight to 10,000 still worked is that he was going to basically use the finer thing to grind off a little bit more. You know, you could go to 4,000 or... Um, and then up to 8,000 and then even up to 10,000. But uh, he just had to work a little bit more. But when, we, uh, when you're looking at a polish like this, it's not much. Hey different. Paul, is there a need for honing in any of this process? This is know? really the honing process. Okay, okay, so right. no leather. This is, hmm? There no is a leather. You don't need it. I've taken to using it, but the trouble with, unlike honing a chisel, with a leather or a carving tool is that it's loose so you can rehone it real quickly because you're keeping a super super fine edge. Right, right, right. When I hone the edge of this plane the first few slices of wood are going to be especially sharp but then it's going to go back to the standard sharpness. So a lot of people who use planes and a lot of people who use chisels don't don't hone with leather at all. But okay. this process of using a very fine stone is also known as honing, because I'm not going to change the shape of this now. So okay. I've gone through shaping, sh shaping, and it's kind of sort of borderline sharpening honing. You know, yeah. Don't get too ho hooked up on the on the nomenclature, but I will use my my uh, leather strop at the end just to demo it. Okay. Um, but it's it's not necessary. But it's a cheap little tool that you can make. And so I I've, I've now established that. I've got a nice surface there, a nice polished surface. And I've gone about as far as I can go with the jig. There's a very, very slight burr there. And that is the way you can tell when you're shaping it. If you can feel a burr along here, it's called a pencil burr. That's absolutely, you need to feel that all the way along. And that means you've actually established your edge. And what you do is you flip it over and you draw it backwards over a stone like this in order to remove it. And you may have to, you can see I'm now also taking off that, that black mark there. I'm gonna take it out of the jig for the rest of what I'm gonna do. But before I do, are there any questions about the jig and using? Can you remind wow. me? Can you remind us what those three buttons were at the top? Uh, in the middle, you said one was for a micro bevel, the middle was yeah. the standard. What was the third one? Uh, for if you want to put a back bevel, which I'm not going to get into because that's a whole other world, but, but sometimes some woodworkers will put a slight back bevel back, back here, or, you know, on the polished side, on the back. They'll put oh, really? an ever so okay. slight bevel. Yeah. Okay. Um, the trouble with that is you've now created a lack of flatness here. So anything that you do that requires registering to this very flat blade is, is not going to be um, quite the same. So you have to be very careful when you do it to just do a tiny bit. Okay. Anyway, and enough. I, I said I wouldn't get into it. But uh, back bevels is a, a subject that I brought up with my hand tool uh, instructor and she said, why would you need to do that? And after she... <laughs> after the end of the class I, I understood why in fact there are reasons sometimes with contrary grain you'll, you'll you'll need to do it but you do do it so finely that you can that you're going to basically grind off the rest of the bevel to get you back to where you were you've done an excellent job do. of not talking about it sorry you've done an excellent job of not talking about it <clears throat> it's not difficult uh, you know easily distracted <laughs> refers to me <laughs> You can get me up on a tangent in no time. Oh, so that's all right. This is this is not a class. This is a gathering. So, <laughs> so I'm going to now just poly, you know, just every time I, I sharpen this up, I'll add to the polish on here. You'll notice I haven't put this back on any stones here. It's because I want to keep this polish. I really want to keep this polish. So I'm now going to. Add a little water to my stone. And just work the back a little bit.
Notice that I'm only going front and back. Now there are, so I think one reason that this, this plane has a little issue is because there may be a back bevel there. Do you see that little piece of black uh, permanent marker right there at the edge in the corner? No? Okay, well there is. So that means I probably got to work on improving the back edge, but again, I don't wanna waste you guys' time. So now, Having drawn this back on a back edge, I'm just gonna try and get my angle. And I, I, people have laughed at me many a time, but I find the only way I can really tell what my angle is in relation to the stone is to get down and look at it. And I also, here's a little tip. As I, if it's got water on it, there's a point at which the water gets squeezed out and you can tell you've hit the edge there. There's a little bead of water comes out and you know that you're pretty close to your edge there. So I'm gonna just very gently do that to get rid of any pencil burr. And then we're gonna go to the... Okay, that feels pretty nice. But probably not quite cut here. Okay, so now I've got, this is actually a viable blade. Three minutes? Oh, oh I'll be running out of it soon, so. Um, this is actually uh, a, a viable blade, right, as it is. But I'm gonna do one more thing to it. I'm going to put that, what we talked about, the bevel here. I'm gonna put that little bevel on here now. And um, you can use this device or you can, train your muscle memory so that you get the angle pretty much. But what I'm gonna do is I'm going to create a tiny, tiny edge at a slightly steeper angle here. And that will help to compensate for this problem I have where the back isn't exactly perfectly flat yet. Um, so I will need that in a moment. But So I'm gonna set this up at an angle of about 37 degrees. I'm gonna just draw back couple of times. I'm on just the super fine, the 1200 grit here. Okay, one more time. And you can, I don't know if you can see, but I have established a tiny little edge right there. And it runs all the way across. If you're, if you're actually, like the way I'm looking at it, I can see a slight dull line there because there's the polished area and then there's a dull line. So now I want to get that polish back onto that line by going to my 8,000 grit. Super, great. Wow, it's just, thank you, Lewis. It's fantastic to have someone handling, you know, anticipating what I need. All right, so now a little bit of water. And then I will check to see that that's turned from a dull line into a polish. I'm not convinced. Okay, now I've got a polish. So now I've got two faces here that have a polish on them. One is, the, is that first bevel that I cut. And then the next one, is that little front bevel there. So now I'm gonna check. I can feel a little pencil bevel on there. So I'm gonna roll that baby off. Do another couple of these. And this is kind of daring but you really can cut yourself with it. So it, it might be a while before you want to check that. Okay, and then finally, sometimes I just talk sheer nonsense, don't I? Let me get it on camera, it's fine. <laughs> okay, so I'm now going to use my hone to just really fine up that particular. So at least my first few cuts are gonna be really satisfying. 
Okay. Feels like there's no edges there. Now it's cutting. That's the difference is that the hone gives you that razor edge where you can actually just cut human hair. Um, you can get it with your 8,000 and so on, but this is, and, and what a hone is here, this is a relatively hard piece of leather, but it's relatively soft compared to steel. And um, it is, it has a, a, a polishing compound. So it's a finer compound even than the eight or 10,000 grit. Um, commonly used, you, you most often think of it as the traditional barbers would use. They had a big leather strop and they strop the uh, razor blades to get them really the old fashioned cutthroat razors. Um, and uh, they, they, they used to use those, they use them to keep them sharp because every time you shave, you take a little bit off that edge. So, you know, um, same with wood. Um, so now we have a blade that's usable. So now the other part of that is the chip breaker. And what the chip breaker does is it kind of holds the blade in tension because it is a th thin blade. And that's where the, 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 re the Bailey made the big difference that you didn't have to use those huge thick blades in order to get, a, get your blade into the right shape. So your, your chip breaker basically sets up real close to the edge of the blade. Again, the finer the cut you want, the closer to the edge. The thickness of a human nail is probably a really good you know, guidance for you. You know, a 32nd of an inch is another one. And then, you know, once you get into trying to get really, really uh, fine cuts, you get it up close. So again, it's important that this be in line with this, right? So this edge has to be square as well. And what it does is that little edge coming down here takes the shavings as they're coming off of the wood and it peels them up. That's why your shavings come out curly like that because they're getting peeled up. As soon as they get cut, they're getting hit by the chip breaker and they're pushing it up. So this surface here wants to be even and smooth and especially where it intersects with your blade here, it should be as close as possible to a perfect fit because what happens is chips get in under here. If it's not breaking the chips, then they're going into it and they get in, in under here and the whole thing clogs up and you better take it to pieces. So I set my chip breaker. Before I do that, I'm gonna just demonstrate it with the 800, 8,000 here. There's a little, there's a little bevel. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, that's a good angle. There, there we go. There's a little bevel right on that edge there, and that needs to be going upward so that this edge is touching the blade and nothing behind it is obstructing it from touching that blade. So when we when we tune this up and when you when you take a plane to bits you get in the habit of doing a little bit of tune up every time you do it so what we do is we take this and it we set it at an angle so that it's coming down off of your stone like that if it's if you're if you're cutting like that you're you're not creating what you want you want that bevel to be backwards there so so we're going to just go back and forth and when it's in tune like this one is, you don't need to do much. You just repolish it, ensuring that that little face there and that edge in particular, that edge in particular doesn't, doesn't drive the chips underneath. So that's, the, that's why it's important to tune this up. And then you can also tune the back of it up there as well. These little details in, in keeping a plane in tune make a world of difference. So now we put our blade back in. I'm going to set my chip breaker for fairly average cut there. Yes, I'm done with that. Thank you very much. Okay, now I look at my chip breaker, and you see just in in tightening up that screw, it's become off parallel. So what I do, I use my screw, screwdriver to tap it to parallel. 
Um, I might go a little further in than that. And these little fine tunings again, are, are, are what can make the difference between planing being a really satisfying experience and it being a miserable, frustrating, pull up the brain. Okay, they don't always fit the width perfectly and you can't always get them lined up perfectly with that one's looking pretty good. So now I'm gonna tighten this screw and it's gone out of cue again. So there we go, that's looking pretty fair. So this is basically a spring now that's holding this in, in a nice firm clean line. So now we're gonna put that back into our plane. And I was stunned the first time I saw, this was just two years ago, I saw Garrett Hack put a blade back, in, take a blade out, put it back in his blade, and just he just started using it straight off. I can't do that, I have to adjust it. But if you have not messed with your with your, especially the in out, the, the depth of the blade, if you've not messed it with it, if you put this back in about the same orientation, you can see that this will slide back and forth and depending on how you set the thickness of this, this. So there's some fine tuning, but if you put it back exactly the same way, then it should cut in exactly the same spot. So you don't have to spend 10 minutes getting everything adjusted. So now, as I put that back in, I will make sure that there's an even gap at the edges here, because that helps to keep it square. So that an even gap there and an even gap there. That looks pretty good. And now I'm gonna put in my cap iron. And this again establishes temp tension, holding the blade down onto the piece of, of steel that it sets on on the frog. Everything else is anatomical, but they call this piece a frog. I don't get it. I must look, look that up and find it. Okay, so now my, my plane is back in action, hopefully. So I'm going to look at, let's go to the big screen as it were. Okay. Great. So, um, there we go. That's a nice angle. So now I'm looking at this and I'll try and line it up as best as I can with the camera. I don't know if you can see, it's sticking up a little high at that side. So I'm going to use my lateral adjuster, that's this lever here, to adjust the. <laughs> I'm going to have to eyeball it. There we go. So, from my angle, so I can't show you at the same time. But the first thing I'm going to do is put the blade so that it's sticking all the way through and seems to be at a reasonably even, um, you know, it, it, it looks as if it, it, it's not sticking up or down too much. So I'm going to look at that and now I'm going to take it back pretty much till it disappears. I don't think I have time to talk to you about the linear adjustment, but in essence, if a piece of, if your blade is sticking up one side, you push the lever, usually push the lever towards that side, towards the heavy side. And uh, the closer, as you pull the blade back, back, you can see this one's still slightly out of kilter, not much, but it's a little off, um, but uh, you just keep an eye on it. And you keep adjusting that lateral lever until at the point where it goes back into the mouth, which I'm watching now, it's reasonably even. So, okay, so now I know that my blade is there. It's not at this second protruding through the mouth and I can even run my finger down it to feel that. And that's something I, I've started doing in the last year or so. And you don't slice your fingers off. You uh, you you get a good feel for it. Um, but anyway, so now we we need a piece of wood. I'm going to terminate this demonstration fairly soon. <laughs> but 
one of the things about working with in small spaces or working in an apartment or wherever is that you don't have necessarily have a full bench, but if you have a few little tools, you can adapt. So for example, holding a piece of wood on a small bench of this size in such a way that you can plane it is, um, is a challenge. But with a, oh, I can never forget, hand screw, is it? These, 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 yeah, the, the uh, I've forgotten the name, but this this vice is is great because you can you or clamp you can use it to there we go to hold other you know you can use it to clamp up, clamp other things to the bench. As you can see, I have no permanent vice on this bench, and if I did have, it's a small enough bench that the uh, balance would probably not be very good. I think it's called a hand screw edge. Okay, so now I have, this is the leg of the saw that I was hoping to, um, to uh, demonstrate some of, but at the moment we're running kind of short on time. So, so I'm gonna just demonstrate getting your plane set up. So I've got a nice sharp edge there. So anytime I cut through it, I'm gonna get a little you see the way I'm running the plane down and I'm moving it from side to side. No part of my blade is touching that. So now I'm going to take my, my lateral adjuster here because I was pulling the blade out, there's some slack in there. But I'm gonna now push it, start pushing the blade down. The, I can just feel the right side of the blade on there. So it's getting very close. I'm not, I don't know if you can see, but you can see I just touched the wood there. So I'm getting pretty close. I can hear as well, using your senses. There we go, that side is giving me another shaving. So I'm gonna go a little heavier than that because we could be here forever. But this is the important part, okay. so. I've always found getting the lateral adjustment, the, the, you know, the parallelness of the blade, if you like, to the mouth to be rather difficult. Um, but this is, again, I, I learned this in a, a Leon, Lee Nielsen, I think he said Leon Perrins, <laughs> um, in a Lee Nielsen demonstration. But the way to make sure that your blade is nice and parallel there is to take it, run it down one side, and you look at the thickness of the shaving that you get. Usually I'd be doing this on a slightly wider piece. And then you run it down the other side and you see I barely got a shaving there. So that means my blade is ever so slightly out of truth. So I'm gonna just, and it really is you, each plane, plane has its own personality, but I'm just gonna push that lateral over just a smidgen. Now I can hear it's making a, a, a deeper cut that side. And a less deep cut that side. So now I wanna adjust it slightly the other way. And it really is, you, it's more feel. I almost find it's easier to close my eyes because looking at it somehow distracts my brain. Give it a little. Okay, so you fine tune that to whatever you need. So now that we've got that, now we're gonna go from a, a real fine cut to something a little coarser. And that's, it took maybe a quarter turn of the, of the adjusting knob there. It's, uh, you can see it, you can watch it come out. So this is a slightly heavier cut. You hear that wonderful noise? See that lovely pearl for our museum? Because I've got it in this hand screw, I can go all the way to the end of the wood. And then, ah, I'm getting impatient, and it's a thin cut, so let's go for a heavy. Oh, went off the side. The important thing using a plane 
is to start with the weight of the front, nice, nicely down on the wood. As you go through, as you get to the end, put your weight on the back because if you put weight on the front, it tends to push that down. That's a sharp blade cutting wood. Um, I really heavy to that now. Now it's beginning to actually involve a little work. So if I were doing a lot of this work, I would have set the plane up slightly differently. I would have given it perhaps an even, even more on the chip break, on the, uh, yes, on the chip breaker. But you can see even in, maybe you can, in the short time I've been working it, there are variations here. So you have to watch it. For example, I have a tendency not to get my plane caught at the beginning there. So you can see it's a little narrower there than it is over. So what I do is I work, oh, I look at that, and I'll do a few compensating cuts. And in this case, I was I'm going to be creating, so in the next session, we'll probably work on this some more. I was going to be creating this, get this to an octagon, and I've got it marked so that I can just plane this down until I've got the face of the octagon, turn it 90 degrees, plane the next face. And away you go. So it's 20 after 11 and my throat's getting dry. <laughs> I thank you guys for listening and I would love to answer any questions or listen to any ideas. And uh, I do want to once again emphasize that I am not an expert. I've only been woodworking a few years, but I am suffering enough to get in front of the camera. So um, thank you for tuning in and any questions. I guess not. All right, Travis, I've appreciated your questions and I always do because you keep me on track while, while sending me off on tangents at times. <laughs> so what, one, one quick question, Paul, because this yeah. is sharpening 101. Um, you haven't mentioned an oil stone. Um, can you use an oil stone with water or do you throw your oil stones away? Um, I, I have oil stones. I started trying to use them, but absolutely no, you can't use oil stones with water. That's, uh, that's why they're called oil stones. Um, and they are the traditional way to do it. That's the way my dad always sharpened his tools. Um, but, but water stones and diamond stones, are um, they're not exactly new technology. Well, the water stones are not new technology. Um, in Japan, they've been around for hundreds of years, but they, they've hit our market in the last 40, 50 years, and, and uh, they make a world of difference. But uh, I, I do, I've kept oil stones, and, and um, they're useful for sharpening knives and scythes and things like that, I think. But uh, um, I've dispensed with oil. Also, I do, oil uh, gets on the wood, it gets in my hands. I don't like it. <laughs> okay. And the other question is, again, 101, why do you always put the plane flat on the table rather than on its side, which I traditionally was always told to do? Okay, the reason I put it flat is because when I'm working, usually I'm, I'll have little bits and pieces sitting around on my bench and it is so easy for me to ding it against there. So I, I keep my bench top reasonably level and uh, I, I, you know, scrape it every now and again with card scrapers. So I, I find I get less damage to my blades by putting this down on wood. Storing them, it's, a, it's best to store them on flat, I think, with a little wedge underneath so that, uh, so that um, you know, the blade isn't touching anything. And I'm going to make some, something like that for home. But uh, at the moment, my bench planes live on the bench and there's no way to... Uh, there's not room enough to put them on the side. So it's, it's uh, just a matter of personal preference, I think, whatever works for you. Good, thank you. All righty. And if there's no other questions, I think it's time that we uh, shut this down. Uh, thank you for checking in and um, look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. <laughs>